Hi, folks. This is John Ross. I just wanted to go over a couple of um, issues about using the link interface, if you've never used it before, and then we'll pass it on to our presenters. Um, we will use a couple of different features in the, um, the session today, including um, if you'd like to change the way you're viewing people, viewing the screen. Right now, you might be seeing a bunch of small blue squares at the top. If you'd like to change it so the presentation is larger, there's a button on the lower right-hand side that allows you to pick from three different layouts. You can pick whatever one you like, and it won't um, change anybody else's view. And we're also going to do some interaction today through chatting as well as using the phone. So in the far left corner of your screen, if you haven't already seen it, is the chat window. And if you click that little brown button with the little comment icon, the chat window will come up. And all you have to do is enter your comments and press return. Uh, that's it for me. I would like to pass this over now to Dr. Sharon Harsh, Director of the ARC, who will present a welcome and introduce our speakers. Thank you, John. Hello and welcome to the ARC webinar. This webinar is one of a series of presentations on cutting-edge issues facing education today. I'd like to thank jo Dr. John Ross for his leadership in directing the webinar series and for his skill and knowledge in conducting technology-based services. Thank you so much, John. Benchmarking capacity building is a topic whose time has come. The ARC and the three evaluators presenting today's webinar are engaged in benchmarking the capacity building services um, that we're providing to the regional comprehensive or through the regional comprehensive center. And we're conducting this webinar today in response to interest across the Appalachia region in designing and implementing state level capacity building services. Detectives investigative reporters, and evaluators all have one thing in common. They know how to look for evidence, and they know how to use evidence to determine the existence of some fact or some event or something that they're trying to prove or disprove. In this webinar, you'll learn to locate and use existing data in your organization that will identify capacity building needs, and to look for evidence that will benchmark the progress that your organization is making in building capacity. I'm very pleased to introduce three highly skilled and knowledgeable evaluators who are presenting today's session, Thomas Horwood, Dr. Caitlin Halley, and Dr. Keith Sturgis. Thank you so much for doing the presentation. Caitlin? Thanks, Sharon, and welcome, everyone. We're really delighted to have you with us today. Um, as Sharon said, I'm Caitlin Howley, and I serve as the Associate Director of the ARC. Uh, my background is in the sociology of education, and in a previous life, um, I was an evaluator of technical assistance programs. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about our other two presenters today. Uh, first up is T.J. Horwood. T.J. is the evaluator for the ARC. Um, he also conducts research and evaluation for state and local education agencies and has investigated the effectiveness of a huge range of um, education interventions. So he knows quite a lot about how to measure things that are difficult to measure. TJ is going to discuss today some great data sources for benchmarking capacity, and then he's going to tell us the story of the Vandalia Department of Education Standards Initiative. Our next presenter is Dr. Keith Sturgis. Keith is an educational anthropologist specializing in the evaluation of technical assistance and change. His work blends together ecological and stakeholder engagement approaches to program planning, development, delivery, and improvement. So he knows quite a lot about the messy work of organizational development and complex change. He's also an accomplished group facilitator, so Keith will guide our discussion later during the webinar. No pressure, Keith. <clears throat> We have three main objectives for today's webinar, as you can see here. Um, if I had to distill it down to one sentence, it would be something like this. Our discussion today is intended to help you uh, begin to explore how to benchmark your SEA's development of capacity using data that you might already have, as well as potential new data sources. So here's the big idea that we're considering today, capacity. That's a really huge concept, and it means uh, different things to different people in different contexts. But for our purposes here, we want to be um, as specific as possible. So in our work, capacity isn't just potential, skills, or great systems. 
it's a group's ability to put their collective knowledge, skills, interdependencies, and systems into action so that they can overcome problems and achieve goals. And we all of us have individually and in groups um, capacity already, but um, even the highest flyers really can benefit from capacity building. But we really have to be honest as well about capacity building. It isn't easy at all, um, and that's for three main reasons. First, it requires continuous change. This means continually um, cycling through assessment, refinement, implementation, and evaluation, and then back again. Uh, secondly, capacity building really depends on um, your team's willingness to define its goals and then consider very seriously how to get there. And third, capacity building can be difficult because it's disruptive. Um, it disturbs things as they are, and it reverberates throughout the organization. So when capacity building is successful, it enhances organizational ability to respond constructively to disequilibrium by doing two things. First of all, by empowering individuals with knowledge, skills, and tools um, that they can use to uh, identify and understand the problems they face, and then devise um, feasible, meaningful solutions to them. And second, by strengthening processes, um, by which I mean things like strategies for ensuring interdepartmental communication, um, and structures, things like lines of authority, so that people collectively and individually can apply what they know and know how to do to addressing problems and ultimately to achieving their goals. Today, we're going to talk about four main types of foundational capacity summarized on this slide here. Um, very briefly, <laughs> human capacity includes things like people's uh, knowledge and skills, um, as well as their determination or will to accomplish goals. Um, it's kind of what inheres in people. Uh, material capacity is just kind of what you think it would be. It's things like funding, equipment, software, office space, kind of the material tools um, that we use. Organizational capacity um, is a bit more complicated because it has to do with interdependencies. And it's concerned with how people across an organization intersect, how they communicate and collaborate among individuals and various teams. And then finally is structural capacity, um, which includes organizational constructs that um, exist kind of independently of the people in those organizations. So structural capacity includes things like guidelines or policies, procedures, and systems, kind of the legitimated way that we do things around here. So very briefly, those are the foundational capacity types we'll be talking about benchmarking today. Now here are some of the questions we hope that we'll consider as we um, work through our vignette during today's webinar. How would you know if your State Department lacked human capacity? What kind of indicators would suggest to you that your team had developed material capacity? What evidence would let you know that your State Department had um, improved organizational capacity or strengthened structural capacity? I'm going to turn things over to TJ now, who's going to talk to you about some uh, great data sources that can help you answer these kinds of questions. TJ, it's all yours. Thank you, Caitlin. And before I jump in, uh, John, can you reiterate where the handout is available? Or I think it got sent around, but is there a place to download it as well? There is. Um, we sent it to registrants in an email. But you can also open it by clicking on, um, in the left hand of your screen, there are a couple of circles with icons in them. The one with the computer monitor um, is clickable. So if you click on that, it'll open up a um, pop-up box. There are a couple of options. There's an attachments options at the top. If you select that, it'll take you to two handouts. One is the Vandalia vignette. And the other is a handout about data sources. Great. Thank you, Caitlin. Mm -hmm. 
So Caitlin mentioned the definitions of these different types of foundational capacity, human, material, organizational, and structural. And I wanted to take some time, first of all, to talk through what are some of the great data sources that are available to SEA staff to gather evidence of these different types of capacity. So you can imagine that some of them are easier to observe than others. And I think what you'll find too that as, as we dig deeper into the, the core definition and the different components of these types of capacity, that what we hope that you'll gather today is just that you'd be able to think beyond what you might normally look at for evidence. So for example, uh, the first one is human capacity. And so, you know, most of you obviously are very familiar with the staff who are involved in the various initiatives that you're planning and developing and implementing. And so you might think about human capacity in terms of staff members' background based on their education or their work experience. Do they have the intellectual proficiency to implement the change that you're hoping to implement? And so that's, that's I would say, kind of the e easiest one to think through. But what we also want you to think through is staff members' disposition during the initiative planning and implementation of the initiative uh, so that you would know, okay, do these staff have the will to make the desired changes that the initiative will hopefully make. And so that helps you dig a little bit deeper into the human capacity element uh, that's the first part of the uh, foundational capacity. The second one is material capacity. And here I've listed three examples of, of great data sources that are available uh, that SEA staff can look to. The first are the fiscal resources. This would be documentation that funds are available to do the initiative. And so that would usually come from your business office or as identified through a grant. Uh, the second one is technologies and software. And the third is materials and equipment. With the last two, we often think of the capacity is of having these things in place. So have you purchased the correct technologies and software to do the initiative? Do you have the materials and equipment in place? Have you purchased that? We also want to make sure that you're looking for evidence that these items have been logged, that they're installed or assembled, and that they're actually available for use for the initiative. So that's another way to look at the material capacity to, to do these initiatives. The third area is organizational capacity. And here uh, we want to think about a few examples of areas where you might observe organizational capacity. And what you're really looking for here is the extent to which the people involved in the initiative are interacting collaborating and communicating. So, for example, for interaction, you may observe meetings to determine whether initiative leaders and stakeholders are regular, regularly interacting to carry out activities. And that would be interacting with each other as well as, uh, you know, the, stake, the leaders interacting with stakeholders, other stakeholders interacting with each other. A second example is that you could work to gather feedback from the team members directly to determine how they are collaborating to accomplish initiative goals and objectives. And thirdly, you can track how initiative leaders and stakeholders are communicating with each other about the initiative goals, progress, and outcomes of the initiative. And I like to think about structural capacity as being from paper to practice. So the different elements within structural capacity that you'd be looking for evidence of would be that the SEA has policies in place and that those policies are highly functioning. That, that means that 
the policies have been written and they've been adopted. And here you want to make sure that, that that would be the first step. The second step would be that the SEA has the SEA has procedures in place and that the procedures are also highly functioning. And these I view as being the formal steps and the guidance uh, that's provided to the staff who are involved in the initiative. And then the last area that you'd look for evidence of would be that the SEA staff are practicing what's written. So that the SEA has practices in place and that they too are highly functioning. This is what I like to think of as what people are actually doing in real life. So after going through through those slides, are are there any questions about the the different types of evidence to look for? <clears throat> Excuse me. And if if you do have questions, feel free to either shout them out or type them in the, the chat box as well. I was going to remind people that if you muted your phone with star six, you can use star six again to um, take the mute back off, or you can use uh, the chat box. TJ, Sarah Seiko has posed a question, which is that uh, will, uh, the, one of the components of human capacity, seems a bit hard to measure. Any thoughts? Well, we think of will, and this is identified in the handout, as interest, patience, and persistence. So, <clears throat> yes, that is a great question. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I like to think of looking for evidence is that through your interactions with staff. So, for example, as you're getting ready to plan an initiative, I like to think of it as those people who who kind of step to the front of the line who say that they're interested in the initiative and that they have, uh, that they, they really want to see the initiative be successful. And so that's one, one way to think about it and one one bit of evidence to look for. And the other the other components that we talk about when we discuss will are patience and persistence. And I think that would be observable throughout the initiative, particularly as things get more difficult with the initiative. Um, if the group gets to a point where they, they might be experiencing some disagreement or um, having difficulty interacting, um, and I think that that would be something that you would look for during during the initiative implementation or or, or even during the planning. Great question. Does anyone have anything to add to that? Okay, why don't we move ahead then to um, our tale of the Vandalia Department of Education. Sounds good. So the example that we've come up with for today's session is the Vandalia Department of Education State Standards Implementation Initiative. And the, this SCA is facilitating a statewide initiative to implement new content standards in English and math. And I think this is timely given that it is summertime and there are several SEAs who are planning implementation of standards. Uh, but in this example, we've focused on three components of the state's effort to, to highlight some of the takeaways in terms of what you might look for uh, in terms of the types of capacity and the evidence of that that those capacities are in place, or if they have uh, if they are having difficulty. So the first the first component is pilot testing of the new state standards, and 
So the pilot test took place in 15 schools, and it involved the development of formative assessments and curricular maps. And it also involved the creation of online PD modules around the implementation of the standards. And they assembled the Vandalia State Standards Pilot Team, or the VSSPT, which was comprised of district and school leaders who were, who were organized to guide the process and report on the implications for the statewide implementation the following summer. And so the 15 schools, we had nine from one large urban district, three from a suburban district, and three from different urban districts. And there were bi-monthly work sessions, uh, the development of the formative assessments, curriculum maps, and the, and the creation of online PD modules. And so upon the completion of the pilot, uh, the three areas, the three capacities, human, material, and structural. So there was evidence of these three. Uh, so for human capacity, some teachers reported needing more content area PD to teach material more deeply as required by the new standard, and they found that not all teachers knew how to use formative assessments. <clears throat> With material capacity, teachers in some of the pilot schools could not access digital material like the PD modules and the formative data, and with structural capacity, the pilot site selection process failed to ensure <clears throat> an adequate representation of district types, and as a result, pilot findings were not sufficiently generalizable to all of all of the districts who would who would fully implement across the state. The second component was regional center professional development for principals and teachers. And these are the intermediate education agencies that were organized to provide these services. And from, from, from this, uh, the organizational capacity was that Vandalia facilitates regular web meetings for regional service centers to help them prepare to provide PD on the standard. And structurally, some regional centers mainly offered webinar PD whereas others facilitated PD workshops on site. The third component is the online implementation support. Uh, to provide ongoing implementation support, Vandalia established and maintains a website for educators across the state. And in addition to the standards themselves, the site includes instructional materials aligned to the standards, the PD modules consisting of videos, <coughs> and regularly scheduled video conferences with instructional coaches. And the takeaways from this were that for material capacity, they found uh, that most districts used the digital resources provided by Vandalia, but some rural districts could not access videos or interactive materials because they lacked robust broadband. And organizationally, <coughs> the site developers do not coordinate with RSCs to obtain support materials for inclusion on the site. Thank you very much, TJ. Um, are there any clarifying questions before we move on to a discussion of um, Vandalia's foundational capacities and how we can gauge where they are? So if you have any clarifying questions, please feel free to speak up or type them in the chat box. But at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Keith. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, this is Keith, um, and I'd like to use the remainder of our time today to, to hear your thoughts on Vandalia's rollout of the new state standards. And to do this, I'd like to draw on your experiences, your knowledge, the cumulative wisdom of the people in the room here um, to identify the strengths and weaknesses of the State Department's efforts to assess its capacity to implement the standards. Um, so first, what I'd like to do is, is talk a little bit about the individual activities. Maybe we can start with the, the pilot testing. What do you think the department did well in assessing its capacity with regard to the pilot testing? Mm 
that the uh, Vandalia had those teams, the um, state standards teams, to be working ongoing seemed to be a positive thing. There was something, a structure then in place to kind of keep track of how things and people were progressing, so that seemed positive. I agree. I think that was a real strength. What else? I also think that it was positive um, for them to recognize that there were different aspects of that capacity building, like uh, the human part, the structural part, the organizational part. The fact huh. that they recognized that was was good. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that too. What else did we? What else was really positive about the pilot testing? Folks have also um, answered some in the chat box. Um, John, for example, said that a positive was that it involved lots of different stakeholders. And Candace says that um, creating online PD modules to support those pilots um, was great. Indeed, well. yeah. And I think one more that I might add would be the the, the sort of the compilation of of results after the pilot period, right? The uh, the last report that was provided back to the State Department. Um, what about some areas that, that uh, Vandalia might might improve its its capacity assessment re in, with regard to the pilot testing? I think that there is clearly an issue there with um, teachers not feeling um, equipped with the ability to go really deeply into subject matter. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a gap there. I agree. What do you think about the choice of pilot sites? Would you repeat your question, please, Chief? Absolutely. What do you think about the choice of pilot sites? Well, it seems to be balanced in that they had uh, rural, and I think um, probably I would have hoped they would have realized that the rural districts would have had problems with all of that online information and the fact that they wouldn't be able to access it. You would think they would have known that up front, but. You, you might. <laughs> you might be surprised. Um, <laughs> I, I saw a, a couple of uh, comments pop up there, um, and I'm on the wrong screen to see what they say. They They, they disappear before I can read them. But I, one of the questions I would have is about the represent, representativeness of of the pilot sites. Do they really represent the diversity of the state? If I'm not mistaken, I think uh, quite a few of them came from one large urban school district. Yeah, and John Ross has pointed out there that um, the results might therefore be kind of skewed in that direction. You know, just for that results might be more generalizable to large urban districts than to other kinds of sites. Right. Anything else on the uh, on, on on the pilot testing? What did you think about the regional service center PD? What did what did VSEA do well in terms of measuring its capacity there? The monthly meetings. Uh, would be a positive uh, aspect of this. Twice monthly via web conferences, so again, people are keeping in touch and able to talk about what they're doing. Right. The conferences with the coaches, would that run through that, that, uh, that part of it? I forget if that was the SEA or the uh, other. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear your question. Oh, I, I was saying I, I thought that it was good that they had the follow-up conferences with coaches, but I couldn't remember if the um, the FDA did that or the other organization. They're 
support group. Yeah, well, yeah, the SEA was, I think, it, it was it was sort of facilitating, was was working all of this activity. Okay. What do you think they could have done better with regard to their assessing the capacity related to the regional service center activity? I think it's it would have been great if they coordinated what they were going to um, present to the LEAs. That way, because um, it seems from the survey data that there were some was some variation in the implementation of PD and how it supported um, teachers felt in the implementation, based depending on the RFC that that was leading that PD. And so, I think there could have been some better coordination there. Yes, great. Yeah. Anything else on the Regional Service Center PD activity? Was there anything uh, related to quantitative and qualitative uh, information on the the training? Good. I, th I think that's I, we're getting into the the, the meaty stuff here, um, and uh, that there might have been a little bit of a, of a of a downside there. We'll come back to that. There are a couple of comments in the chat box as well. On the positive side, John says it seems like they've given the participants some autonomy to think about and continue their professional development. And he said the follow-up survey was a nice touch too. On in the more, um, you know, we have oppor an opportunity to grow side of things, Sarah mentions lack of consistency in delivery methods, which I think I heard Candace mention earlier. And Ann notes, um, is there any relationship between teachers feeling well-prepared and professional development via webinar or workshop? All great comments and questions. What about the online support? Well, I think that online support is good. Um, the teachers have the time and uh, and access it, I, I think that um, that's where that coordination with the coaches would need to come in to make sure that uh, teachers knew that it was there, what that uh, how to access it easily, and uh, work closely with their teachers to um, make that online support accessible and usable for them. What about in terms of um, Vandalia's efforts to, to gauge its capacity with regard to the online support? Well, there's no evaluation of it at all. Yeah, right. And it would, yeah, it would be really hard to know how they're using it and if they're using it correctly and uh, if it's making it has an impact. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's hard to say whether or not something's working if you don't have any any documentation. Um, now I'd like to move on, move our discussion um, to the more general question about Vandalia's capacity to assess its capacity. And I guess the first question would be, what kinds of data does Vandalia probably already have? You know, what what's what what are some of the data sources that are already available to Vandalia uh, for documenting its capacity to roll out the new state standards? I think meeting agendas can be a good data source. They show who's meeting with whom, about what, and how often. Good, and I, I think I would add to that probably minutes of the meetings if there are any. Right, maybe if they have an implementation plan. Yes. Uh, with uh, people responsible for certain parts of that implementation. and a, a way to hold them accountable and uh, to get feedback from them about how it's going. Agree. Anything yeah. else? Well, if there are evaluation data related to any associated component of the initiative, those data would be useful. Yes. Um, from the chat box, 
um, archives of webinars and web statistics? Web statistics, absolutely. Yep. So, so given this this set of data that we've just generated, or just this list of data that we've just generated of likely data types that Vandalia already has available, what do you think they still need? What would help them assess their capacity with regard to this bigger initiative of implementing their new state standards? I would think we need um, feedback from the actual people who were the recipients of that PD. Say a little bit more. What, uh, I, I get what you mean by feedback, but feedback um, from, and what kind of questions would you ask? Uh, um, do you have uh, the knowledge and skills that you need to uh, implement the Common Core? Uh, do you have uh, the resources that you need? Um, what roadblocks are there? What barriers are there? What do you still need? I, I think that, the, to me, working with FEA, the big missing piece in trying to implement something was that they rolled it out and they provided all this information, uh, and then they didn't follow up with um, the questions to make sure that the people who were supposed to receive that information got it and used it in the right way. That to me that and and they weren't allowed to then say, Well, I need more of this, I need this, I still don't understand that. You know, there was just no feedback loop there. To me that's the biggest missing piece in that capacity part. If you're if you're really going to implement something you need to have a a way to have feedback loops in there, and I don't think that FEAs do that um, so much that I've seen. That's well, we feel their pain. I mean, we know Vandalia is very busy trying to manage this big initiative. Um, oh, I know. And, and personnel is always a problem. Right. <laughs> um, there's a couple of comments from the chat box. Um, John says, they need to know who's actually using the standards and implementing them with fidelity. Uh, Doug has suggested participant survey data mm -hmm. and recommended website use data and evaluation. Um, Sarah asks, since few schools are using formative assessment data, is it an access issue or a knowledge and skills issue or something else? And John says um, the focus is more on use than efficacy, suggesting, I guess, that efficacy is also um, an important question. Mm-hmm. Indeed. So if we were to take what Vandalia already has available, what it's already using to assess its capacity, and then we superimposed, we added these 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 new um, measures, these new data sources like the feedback and participant surveys, would they have everything they need to really to be able to assess their capacity? Or in other words, would they be fully equipped to uh, to improve the, the state standards rollout initiative? John says uh, they really need that feedback loop that Janine mentioned. Yes, they do. And I guess the proof of the implementation will be when they get their achievement scores and they get, you know, how this could get those test results. But that would be sad to have to wait that long. So here's another way to ask that same question. Aside from data, what else does Vandalia need to assess its capacity? Is it just a matter of data? Well, the way you asked that suggests no. That's good. Well, so elaborate for us. Um, I think that, first of all, they kind of need to um, conceive of their roadmap. Where are they now? Where are they going? What kind of capacity capacities do they need to get where they're going? 
And I think that they need a schema, a plan, an approach to make sense of all their data, how to pull it together and analyze it to make meaning of it. Yes, absolutely. And there's one more piece that I would add, to, at least one more piece, but one one piece in particular that I think is is really important. Um, anyone want to take a stab at it? John has asked, what are their indicators of success? Do they have the right data match to each indicator? Right. So we have the right data. We have the right systems for understanding or making sense of those data. But then there's one there's one more thing that we probably need. And it looks like some more folks are typing. Right. So maybe we have some answers. Here. Could you ask a leading question, Keith? I, I think we're I'm, – I'm going to give it a second here. I'm going to see where we're going. Okay. Um, Sarah's written, I think that feedback is necessary, but it's not sufficient. What precise actions are taken based on that feedback, and how do the actions help to achieve outcomes? Yes, Sarah gets the goal. <laughs> <of> the <day. laughs> yeah. um, Doug Walker has also um, added – this SEA initiative is built on a collaborative effort involving three partners, the SEA, regional service agencies, and local districts and schools. That is the complexity that our assessment needs to understand and assess. Absolutely. That's a great point. Yeah, yes, it really is. Um, so what are some of the barriers that might prevent uh, Vandalia from accessing or gathering those data? People, time, and money. <laughs> time and money. <laughs> Why Say a little bit you? more about the people side of that. Well, if, you know, Sharon always talked about the head nodding syndrome, which is kind of what uh, Sarah met, I think. Uh, you know, you can talk to a teacher or someone about something, oh, yes, yes, I know that, I understand that, but, it, but do they do it? That's a different story. So getting someone actually into that classroom to see if they – and really are doing what they need to be doing and under, are teaching in the way that uh, the Common Core says that they need to be teaching. That's different from them saying, yes, I'm doing, I understand, and I know what I, I'm, oh, yes, I'm doing that. I've, and I have a perfect example of that. I did some PD with the district just in December, and I did a self-assessment for teachers on, uh, oh, there were about 50 different behaviors that um, they do, that the Common Core would like to see teachers doing in the classroom, and I, I knew these teachers well, and just to watch them go through this self-assessment was uh, interesting. Uh, so I think that people sometimes think they're doing things and they're not really doing them uh, uh, sufficiently, or they understand, but they're not doing it. But anyway, I'm just saying I agree with Sarah that and to get someone, get people in there to really get that um, evidence that, that it is being done right, that would take a lot of people and a lot of time. Yes, it would. That's right. really would. So that, that's a good setup for the next question here, which is, so if Vandalia was using feedback from teachers, um, say, say surveys from the pilot sites, uh, let's say interviews with principals, um, let's say maybe student benchmark tests of some sort, um, and some of the other data types that we just discussed, which of those are probably, would you put sort of as the, as the priority data types for assessing capacity? Can you list those again real quick? Yeah, sure. We have feedback from teachers, um, surveys from the pilot sites, Interviews with principals. Um, and if, if I missed any, please uh, chime in, folks. Oh, we, we had web-based data uh, and then student benchmark tests. I would say the benchmarks would actually be 
Benchmarks of what? Benchmarks of student, uh, ben students taking benchmark achievement tests or a teacher or benchmarks like in a rubric that you've made for your implementation. You met this benchmark, that benchmark. What, what kind of benchmarks? Why don't you answer that question? What, what, what do you think um, would serve our purposes best for, for these new state standards? Well, I'll chime in. I would say that you would eventually want benchmark test data, but not in the early part, um, because we even know that our benchmarks are going to be appropriately aligned. So I would want to go more at the, at the teacher level with implementation of what's going on. And in terms of feedback, I think of a lot of different kinds of feedback. I want to see videos. I want to see lesson plans. I want to have classroom observations. I don't want just people to just re reply to a survey. Okay, good, good. And then, you know, you were talking about earlier what, what people might lack, and I think people sometimes don't have an understanding of all the material, uh, the material capacity, as TJ was talking about earlier what can be provided from different kinds of services. Um, often through web-based services, there's all kinds of data you can collect about who people are and how they're using It's just the level of security that you're allowing or your level of access that you're allowing people to come in. So I think you could uh, bump that up and, and very easily collect a great deal of data about who's using what and how and what is effective that way. Good idea, especially for the online, I would think, for the online uh, um portion of the, if the online activity, online PD modules. Sarah has asked an interesting question. Is there a distinction between feedback and evidence? Ooh, that is an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Who wants to answer that question? <laughs> there is a difference. Is one a kind of the other, or is, are they two different things? I always think feedback is self-reported. I would say that feedback is probably a type of evidence. I mean, it has some flaws built into it, but it is some indication of what, what people are thinking and how they're feeling about the initiative. Yeah, I think I agree. I think I tend to think of feedback as, as more effective. It's not always effective, but um, that is touchy um, more about sub It's more subjective, uh, but it can be terribly important as a form of evidence, especially if we think about what John just mentioned about having a multitude of, of, of data types. I think that was John. Um, and when we, when we put feedback into conversation, if you will, into dialogue with, with other types of data, um, we can... It can certainly help us interpret. Touchy failure, yeah. So, <laughs> so if we were to choose, say, three types of data of all of those that we've discussed, which which of those would you would you think would be the most important for assessing the capacity of Vandalia in terms of its roll out of these new state standards? When you say assessing its capacity, are you talking about the administration, the, the central office people, or the impact in the schools? That's a great question. Um, I think what we're talking about is the State Department's capacity. Candace has um, added that she thinks that student benchmark test data might be most important. Yeah, especially as we get down the line. What else, what, what, what do the rest of you think? John um, has written in the chat box that the that Vandalia could probably assess their capacity to roll out the initiative without student data, um, although that does seem like a logical long-term outcome that they want to look at. Okay. Well, 
Well, I don't, I'm, nobody's chomping a bit here, so I, I mean, I'll jump in. I think that I would be most interested in some of the implementation feedback from pilot sites because that's, you know, a trial run, and yes. I, I'd want to know how people interfaced with the materials and um, what they wanted to improve in the PD and that kind of thing. That's right. I think there were a lot of missed opportunities with uh, with Vandalia's efforts, and, that, and that's where it comes from. That's where it stems from initially. And I think that when you when you take a look at all of the different activities related to their rollout of the state standards, a lot of the the issues go back to what happened during the pilot study um, when when they had a, a very skewed sample of, of, of folks. They it was the the implementation wasn't uniform at all, which isn't always a horrible thing, but when you when you do an assessment or an evaluation that relies on uh, uniformity, uh, sometimes that can be misleading when, when we when we look at a boiled down set of lessons learned. Um, I know we just have a few minutes left, so I'd like to turn our attention to the last sort of set of questions here uh, and talk about some of the implications of data collection and data systems. Um, what are your thoughts about how Vandalia might benchmark its progress over time? So, for instance, thinking about its efforts to run the online support site, in what ways would Vandalia expect to see their data change as they increase their capacity to run the online support site? I would think if those online support sites had value, then the uh, the web statistics would show increases in usage. And Janita said the same thing. More folks would be accessing the site. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so more folks would be accessing the sites. That that makes a lot of good sense. What else? I, I might expect to see more contributions from other parts of the system, like the regional service centers. Yeah. We're supposed to be providing PD. Right, and I was thinking that um, if folks find the site really valuable, then they're going to want to start adding certain things to that site, maybe, and, and try sharing across schools or ideas and things. Uh, and Uh, I'm sorry, Janine, we had difficulty hearing you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, you know, I'm just thinking if, if teachers find a site or a tool um, to be helpful, then they're going to jump on board with it and want to add their own things and uh, more materials and more information and, and, you know, use it more and develop it more. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask one last question here. Sometimes data collection efforts overlook the likely burden on SEA staff, district personnel, and of course schools. Uh, so, for example, if, if principal interviews are used for each activity at least once a year, and they might average, say, an hour apiece, or at least that's what that's what I tend to do. And how many interview hours will each principal be expected to participate? So, what are the implications? for all this data collection on, on, on the folks who are supposed to be doing the work. One implication would probably be the question asked, what do you want me not to do so I can do this instead? <laughs> Perfect question. Really good. What else? Any ideas about how the department might minimize its negative impacts on participants while while trying to maximize its its positive impacts in terms of assessing capacity? Well, a lot of this is related to a teacher evaluation, I would think. And if uh, a principal has to do um, observations as part of the regular teacher evaluation, uh, I would think this would just be a kind of a natural part of it, and you could maybe tie those two together somehow, so it wouldn't be two jobs, but, but one. 
yeah, I think that sort of borrowing from that idea, uh, and thank you for saying that, um, maybe maybe using the same data sources for, for multiple purposes. Yeah, a, a piece <clears throat> that that might also want to consider is, uh, you know, people at the end of, of the year or whatever you're looking at, uh, how much turnover have you had? And is there a plan for uh, additional training, repeating this training for people who were not there uh, or people who may need a second round of it just to, you know, it didn't quite take the first time, so let's go back and do it again. It just appears to me a lot of that's not done when it really needs to be done. Good point. Yeah. So, sort of optimizing the onboarding process is that is that kind of is that yes. just, yeah yeah that's and, a really good and, point. And uh, you know, there were probably some people who were on board already, but for whatever reason, weren't didn't take the training. They were sick. They were you know whatever. Right. Hey, Keith, this is John Ross, and I know we only have about a minute left, but can I ask you a question? I like that, you know, the, the scenario was helpful, but can you then turn that around and say, what should an SEA be thinking about when they have a different kind of initiative? How can they be thinking about uh, this evaluating of capacity? Uh, could you say part of that, the last part of that question again? What should they be thinking about when they're going to evaluate their own capacity? They might have an issue that's different than this one. What, can you give them some general advice about that? Well, I I, there's, I, I agree with you, first of all, that um, having a, a multiplicity of data types is, is probably absolutely imp- – I mean, you'd, I, I, I wouldn't want to rely on one type of data. Um, I would strongly advocate, um, you know, having as many different types of data as possible. In addition to that, having a really strong data plan is, is important. You know, how, how are we going to make sense of these data? Um, and, of course, being able to collect information that's actually going to lead to, to some sort of change um, that's going to be implementable down the road. Um, this isn't open, you know, sort of academic research. Um, I, I know we've run out of time, and so I want to thank you all for sharing your thoughts and experiences. Um, this conversation is really far from complete, of course, but I hope it was helpful in broaching the topic of assessing capacity building efforts. A big part of it is the question of accessing the right data. Another part is, you know, having the right process in place to understand what those data are saying or trying to say to you. Um, and another is being realistic about um, about use of those data to make improvements. And I, I would add to that that um, – that it's also making sure that the data you're collecting isn't derailing folks from from doing what's most important. Um, I'd like to turn it over to you all and ask if you have any questions for the panel. And I think because we're just about out of time, if you have any lingering questions, please feel free to email um, the ARC. Um, you can, if you have my email, you're welcome to send them to me, or we have a kind of organizational email, info at arc, A-R-C-C-T-A dot org. So I'm going to thank Keith and TJ very much for um, their great presentation and also for Sharon, John, and uh, Kim Cook's contributions. Um, I will say that this kind of work is part of what the ARC does. We um, help state departments figure out what they want to do, where they want to go, how to get there, how to measure things along the way so that they know when they do arrive or when there's a potential roadblock, and then help them think about how to work around that roadblock so can, they can ultimately achieve what they hope to achieve. So we'd like to thank you very much for your participation today um, and invite you to continue connecting with us. This kind of webinar is just the beginning of these kinds of conversations. Um, I will also say that your goals are in many respects our goals, and our services are designed to help you achieve them. Please feel free to visit our website, follow us on Twitter, check out our videos on YouTube, um, or call or email us anytime. Thank you again, and have a great Tuesday.